Our next speaker is John West. David and John and I were standing up here just a few minutes ago, and we always go through the kind of the routine of, you know, well, well who's introducing and who's going to lead prayer and this sort of stuff. And David suggested that uh, John just do it himself because uh, he is uh, truly a triple threat man. I don't know whether you recall it. I, I don't hear the term too much anymore, but in sports it, there was a triple threat man that uh, football he could pass and kick and, and run and do everything that needs to be done. And uh, I'm proud to say that John really is triple threat, threat man. He can, he can preach and he can lead singing and he can teach and I mean, it's quadruple threat, man, isn't it? Because he can put you in the slammer, too. <laughs> John is a uh, deputy sheriff in Montgomery County, and uh, we're really, I'm, I'm proud of him for that, that he prevailed and went through through all the rigors of doing that. It wasn't easy, was it? I <laughs> Well, that's relative. That's relative. <laughs> John is married to the farmer Sonia Caudill. They have three children, Lauren, Jonathan, and Joshua. John graduated from Memphis School of Preaching back in the old days, in 1989. Faulkner University in 1991, he has a BA in Bible. Fried Hardeman University, he has a master's degree there. And the Houston Community College Police Academy. He's an instructor and academic dean for Truth Bible Institute. Preaches for the Dayton Church of Christ in Dayton in Dayton, Texas, and is a deputy in the Montgomery County, Texas Sheriff's Office. We're proud of John. We're pleased to have him with us here at this congregation. Uh, he is uh, the type of uh, fellow that just about anything you ask him to do, he has a willing and uh, able spirit. And uh, thank you for being here, John. Now come talk to us. Thank you, buddy. And I will say I'm glad that you're the one that introduced me. <laughs> because from some previous introductions, uh, that was pretty good. <laughs> it beats some of the other, well, I can't say it beats it. At least you didn't give me a hard time as like normally happens. No, sir. This is it. <laughs> but you get last word. <laughs> it is my privilege to be here with you today and... I always enjoy the lectures. Last year, I had not been with the sheriff's office but about four or five months. I did not have a lot of time built up to be off. And so I missed, um, I guess, about half of the lectures, maybe more than half. And this year, I took off so I could be here. So I'm glad I had the time that I could take off and be able to spend this week with the lectures. I told Sonia it's um, refreshing especially with the kind of people that I deal with on a daily basis, the kind of, I guess, not only language, but attitudes and things that I deal with, it's good to be refreshed through something like this. Our lesson at hand this afternoon is Christ confronted era about his kingdom. We see all throughout the New Testament Christ confronted era, thus our lectureship this time, but he confronted a lot of error on his kingdom, concerning his kingdom. There are those in the first century as well as those today who had the misconception and who have the misconception about the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Part of the very ministry and mission of Christ on this earth was not only to establish his kingdom, but to preach concerning that kingdom. And it seemed that as we read the life of Christ, the more he preached, the more the Jews opposed him. The more he tried to convince them of that coming kingdom, the more they wanted him dead. And similar to today, the more some of us preach about the kingdom, maybe not wanting us dead, but people want to oppose it and oppose us for saying what the Bible teaches about it. During Jesus' ministry, he continued to teach concerning the kingdom. John the baptizer was preparing the coming of the way of the Lord, and he preached the coming of the kingdom. The apostles preached that coming of the kingdom while Jesus was here and following the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension to heaven on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Peter preached that that kingdom of which Joel prophesied was coming that day, was there that day, giving all men an opportunity to obey the gospel, to become a part of that kingdom. 
And some 3,000 that day did. Some 3,000 souls were added to the church. In the eyes of the Jews, they wanted an earthly kingdom, one that could fight against Rome, one that could be a warring kingdom. They had armies and generals overthrowing the Roman army so they could be a world power. They had the wrong concept about the kingdom. And again, some people have a very similar concept about the kingdom. Some think that Christ will come again in the millennial reign, sitting on the throne of David. He's going to destroy and defeat those who are against him and opposed to him. And they fail to see that the kingdom was a spiritual kingdom. They fail to understand the very nature of which that Jesus preached concerning this kingdom. And the apostles preached and what is written in God's holy writ for us today. Jesus made it clear that his kingdom was a spiritual kingdom. It wasn't going to be a kingdom made up of armies and soldiers, although we are, but not in the physical sense. Paul in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18 tells us that we're to put on the whole armor of God. We are soldiers of Christ. But not in the sense the Jews wanted us to be soldiers and wanted to be soldiers. Not in the sense that some even today want the same thing. They want a warring kingdom. The teaching of Jesus concerning the kingdom caused great controversy during his time. The Jews rejected him. When Christ confronted the Jews concerning the kingdom, they wanted him dead. They did not like what he had to say. They rejected it. And folks, there are those today that are continuing to reject Jesus and his Bible doctrine concerning the kingdom. Oh, they may not want a warring, fighting kingdom like the Jews did. Some might. Most don't. But they want a kind of kingdom that will please them. That's what the Jews wanted, wasn't it? They had in their own mind how the kingdom should be. And when it wasn't like they wanted it to be, they rejected Jesus. We have people that have in their own mind today how they want the kingdom, how they think the kingdom should be. And when we teach them what the Bible teaches concerning the kingdom, they reject it the same. Today, rather than fighting and war, we want hugs and kisses. That's all people want in the kingdom today. Oh, it's, uh, I'm okay, you're okay. Let's not worry about what we believe. It doesn't matter what people do. Let's have good social activities. I had someone one place I was preaching attended services for a while and then quit coming. I'd gone and visited this individual, had him coming, and then he left. I went to visit him again. He said, oh, I wasn't really coming for uh, the worship. He said, I don't really care about that. I was coming for the social interaction. You've got some good people that go to church there. And I enjoyed socializing. Folks, sadly enough, that's what a lot of people are looking for in the kingdom today. They're looking for a social kingdom, one that will make them feel good about themselves, one that will give them activities, and one that will give them something to do. That's why you're seeing these churches pop up all over. They've got uh, various activities for not only the young but the old. They'll have a gym for the young to play basketball. They'll use it for aerobics for the older. They'll have a walking track or a running track either up top. I've seen them with the two-story, the walking track around the top of them, or they'll have a, a paved track outside. Some will have football fields, soccer fields, baseball fields. Anything they can do to draw a crowd. They're all about the social interaction. Jesus preached concerning the kingdom. And the message he gave concerning his kingdom was totally opposed to what the Jews stood for then and what many people stand for today. Well, I want to look for the next few moments, and I'm going to get into some modern things later in the lesson, but I want to look for the next few moments back in the Word of God and look at some parables concerning errors about the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you would turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21, I'm not going to touch on all of them that are in the the book. We're going to touch only on a few. There are others that I did not include in the book for time or rather for space in the book. Uh, But There are others concerning the kingdom as well that could have been touched on. But look at this in Matthew chapter 21. Verse 28, it says, What think ye? A certain man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go to work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And he went not. Whither them twain did the will of his father? They said unto him the first. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. 
Many of these Jews rejected Jesus. They didn't like what he talked about, about the kingdom. And in this particular lesson, we find that there is a lesson given about two sons. One son absolutely refused to go in the vineyard work. I will not go. I don't want to do what you said to do. But later repented and went. If you look down in, uh, toward the end of this, verse 31, he's describing that group. Then he goes to the second son. Yes, sir, I'll go. But he lied to his father and he didn't. Many of the Jews were feigning faithfulness to God, saying, we're looking for your kingdom, Father. We're wanting to do what you're saying. But they refused to do it. They were giving lip service that they were faithful, yet they were not doing God's will. You had the publicans and harlots, those of society that we'd look at as immoral or sinful people, refused at first to do God's will, and many of these people came back and they repented. Many of these obeyed the gospel. You see some of these being added to the church. The Jews, a lot of them, particularly your scribes and Pharisees, they didn't want anything to do with the kingdom. They rejected it. Thus prompted Jesus to tell them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. It's a little bit harsh. He confronted an error about the kingdom. They didn't like what he had to say. But they didn't like a lot of what Jesus had to say. These religious leaders of Jesus' day should have been the first one to listen and obey the gospel. The ones that had been reading and studying and those who knew the law knew that there was a Messiah coming, knew that He would establish His kingdom. And when He came and said, I am He, and this is the kingdom I'm going to establish, it did not fit their mold. Thus rejected it. We have some of that same attitude today. We've got a lot of preachers present. How many times, brethren, have you gone out to talk to people who have some sort of religious background and they say, I want to go to heaven and I want to do the will of God and then you open the Bible up and you start studying this is what the will of God is for you and then they reject it and walk away. Every one of us have had that happen more than once. And it's sad when you have a, a prospect you think that is a good prospect and you start talking to a person about the gospel. And they want to listen. They start studying. But then, oh, it comes to a point they don't like. And they walk away. Matter of fact, there were several of us. I remember Jack, uh, Jeff, and I met with a, a young man who visited here several times. We started having Bible studies with him. He wanted to do what was right. He told David after one of the sermons that he really appreciated the lesson. He enjoyed hearing someone preach just the Bible. He had gone to various religions, and none of them preached the Bible like was preached here. He was interested in studying the Bible. We met with him three or four times, but we got to one point in the session of the Bible study that disagreed with his life or with the things that he had in mind he wanted to do, the things he thought the kingdom ought to be, and he left. The next week, we came back for the Bible study. We waited here, called his cell phone. He didn't answer. We called it several times. He didn't answer. We waited several days, called it again. He refused to pick up our calls. Never came back. Those people who say they want to go to heaven and those people who say they want to do what is right sometime will. But often are like these scribes and the Pharisees. They're putting on a show or an outward side of themselves as being some great spiritual person when in actuality they're not. And they're not seeking the truth. They're seeking something that will make them feel good about themselves. And this world is full of that today. But let's go on into Matthew 21 even further. The parable of the wicked husbandman. Verse 33 beginning. And I'm not going to read this passage. This verse is 33 through verse 46. But in this and summarizing, when the time of the harvest drew near... The householder sent his servants to collect the fruits. Now the householder planted a vineyard, hedged around about it, the first part of this parable tells us, built a tower, then he led it out to a husbandman and went to a faraway country. Then he sent his servants back to collect the fruits. Now that husbandman did not want to give these things up. He beat one. He killed another. Mistreated these servants. So... He sent more servants 
to this husbandman. Did the same to them. Finally said, I will send my son. He's the heir of all of this. Surely they'll listen to the heir. They'll listen to what he has to say and respond. They sent the heir, or he sent the heir, and they killed him. And you see where we're going with this. God sent his prophets of the Old Testament to prophesy concerning the coming of the kingdom and the coming of Jesus Christ. And those people of that day killed them, mistreated them, abused them, didn't listen to them. Sent others. Same thing happened. Finally sent his son. And they did the same thing. They killed his son. They put him on the cross. The question then was asked by Jesus. When the Lord of the vineyard cometh, what will he do to those husbandmen? The Jews' response, that's in verse 40. In verse 41, their response was, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. And he lets them know that's exactly what's going to happen. They continue to reject him, then the Gentiles are going to be brought in. And that's even a slap in the face to the Jews for them because to allow some other nationality or some other person, some other group, to allow to be in the kingdom of God, to be part of God's family. We're God's family, they said. Yet they rejected God. And they rejected His message. And just as some have to do today with their own family, you have to disinherit some of your own family. You have to get rid of some of your own family. We mean get rid of you take them out of the wheel. You have nothing to do with them. Some... We have family that are members of the Lord's church. Sometimes we have to withdraw fellowship from our own family because of what they've done. God allowed Jesus to come live, as was mentioned in the prayer, and die a perfect death for us. He allowed Jesus to suffer all that He did to save us from our sins. But He did it even for those Jews who rejected Him. And yet they had misconceptions concerning the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And Jesus had to correct their errors. Yes, he was controversial during his lifetime. With many subjects, we've already heard some of them. But with the kingdom, he was trying to get them to see, this is going to be something of which you can be a part, and you can be saved through, and that you can live faithfully in this kingdom and have heaven as your home. And the Jews continued to reject him. Since the Jews had been God's chosen people in the Old Testament, they thought, and again, we understand that those faithful Jews were those who God blessed and those who were God's chosen. And they thought that because of a nationality, they were God's chosen, and no matter what they did or what happened, they were going to remain God's chosen. And they failed to serve him and follow him. They brought harm to Jesus by putting him on that cross. Jesus did confront their error. And Jesus foretold in this particular parable what they would do to him. And they did exactly what he said. But let's go further. Back in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus confronted other errors concerning the kingdom, one of which was a rich young ruler. In Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22, we have a young man that came to Jesus. He fell down at his feet and he said, Good Master, what good things shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. He says, But if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. The young man asked, Well, which? Jesus gave him a list of commandments to keep. His response was, well, all of these things that were kept from a youth up, what like I yet? Uh, he wasn't prepared to hear what Jesus was about to say. He was thinking, well, Jesus is going to give me something easy. I've already done all these things. It's a piece of cake. I'm a shoe in for the kingdom now. Go and sell all you have and give to the poor and take up your cross and come follow me. But it said the young man went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Jesus gave him his requirements that he needed to do. He's been keeping the commandments, he said. Then do this. You want to enter into the kingdom? Then quit trusting in your riches and put your trust in me. 
And that young man wasn't willing to do so. He wasn't willing to give up what he had materially. On the surface, he seemed very respectful to Jesus. He fell down at his feet as in a servitude position. Good master, what good thing shall I do? Addressing him with respect. Yet when push came to shove, or as we always said, buddy, where the rubber meets the road, he wasn't willing to do what Jesus wanted him to do. His error concerning the kingdom, he thought he could have a quick fix. I want to get into heaven. What can I do? Jesus, give it to me now. I'll go on my way. I'll leave you alone. You leave me alone. We'll all be happy. Is that not what some people want today? They want a quick fix. Yeah, I want to go to heaven. What can you do for me? What can you give me? What can I get? What can I have? I'll leave you alone. You leave me alone, and I'll see you in heaven one day. Folks, it doesn't work that way. And people have those same kind of errors today. We're going to get into that just in a moment in our next um, passage we're going to discuss. People have that idea that the kingdom is fun and frolic, playing, good times. Everything that I want, everything that makes me feel good, that's all that we need in the kingdom today. You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. We'll all be fine. We'll get along great. We'll all go to heaven. We'll have one big old party up there. You know, listen to some people talk about the kingdom, the way some people believe about the kingdom, the way they act. There's got to be some 18-hole golf courses in heaven somewhere. A lot of football fields, baseball, basketball. We won't get tired. We can play as long as we want. Dive off in the everlasting pool, the water of life or something, and have all the fun and the frolic, frolic we can imagine. That's the way some people view heaven. And they want the same thing here. And they think, well, God's going to give it to me there too. So let's don't make it too hard for me. I've got other things to do in my life. Folks, let's go to our next passage, Luke 13. The narrow door. That's going to answer this attitude. Luke 13, verses 23 through 30. Someone came and asked Jesus a question, verse 23. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Good question. Lord, and what you've been teaching, does that mean there's not going to be a lot of people going to heaven? There's going to be few? I thought everybody was going. Here's what he said in verse 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. You mean some can't go to the kingdom of God? Some are not going to make it to heaven? What's the deal, Jesus? You mean I've got to do something? It's going to be hard? Well, it doesn't have to be as hard. It can be as hard as we make it. It can be as easy as we make it, or it can be as hard as we make it. We can make it hard on ourselves by the way we live, or we can live in service to God and make it easier on ourselves, but it doesn't always mean things are going to be easy. We face difficult challenges. We face problems. We had our faculty meeting during lunch, and in one point of it, we were kind of away from topic a little bit, started making jokes about things that some of us have faced as preachers. All of us at one time or another have been fired. I don't know a preacher yet who's worth his salt and has done his job, hasn't been mistreated some way or the other. I know a lot of members who have faced difficulties. They've been mistreated. I know elders and deacons who have been mistreated, and I know some have mistreated others. It goes all the way around. But folks, it doesn't mean life's always going to be easier, easy, but it's sure a lot better when we serve God. And we can make life as easy or as hard as we want to make it. But it also means that there are some things we have to do in this life, and there are times we have to strive hard at, that's going to cause difficulties. We're always striving, but there are times we have difficulties because of what we do. That word strive in the Greek carries the idea that you're working with every fiber of your being. You're digging and scratching. You're working hard. I would equate it to uh, it's like a man's got to dig a ditch, buddy, and you don't have that backhoe. You don't have a trencher. All you got is one good old shovel and a, either a strong back, a weak back, or you'll have one of the two when you get through. <laughs> or maybe a weak back when you get through. But you get in there and you dig and you dig hard. You work and work. Jack knows a little bit about that and some of the ditches he's dug up in his property and some of the things he's had to do to be working on it. It'd be hard work, physical labor. But folks, spiritually, sometimes we have to work hard to 
overcome temptation. We have to work hard to overcome Satan. We have to work hard sometimes to even overcome some of our own brethren. Because they're not striving. They look at us because we are. And then they ridicule us, mock us, say things to us. Right now, I don't really care what people say about me. They can say what they want. They can like me or hate me. It's just, it's, it's up to them. I know some of us up to me the way I, I do, but a lot of us up to them whether they like me or hate me. I am what I am. But folks, we can live this life and cause ourselves problems by what we say or do, or others can do the same thing. And we need to try to do what we can to serve God faithfully, whether people like it or not. You stand up for the truth, people are not going to like you. We're striving. We're working. We're doing all that we can to enter in at that straight gate. He says, For many, I say, will seek to enter therein and shall not be able. Well, why can't some go in? Because they're not willing to strive. They're not willing to dig down. They're not willing to work at it. They want it handed to them on a silver platter. That's how some people view the kingdom today. And Jesus confronted that error concerning the kingdom by saying, There's a narrow door. And a lot of you are not going to make it. There are going to be some coming from the east and from the west, from the north and the south. They're going to come from all directions. And some of you are going to be shut out. But notice, in this, there are those who are going in and those who are coming out. But then when the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, those on the outside are going to stand outside. Hey, let us in. Where, what happened? You shut the door and us let us in. He's going to say, I don't know who you are. All my friends... All my people are on the inside. See, these people on the outside weren't striving. They weren't doing God's will. And the door is going to be shut. And he said, you're going to stand outside knocking. I don't know who you are. You're not on the inside now? Sorry. Or as I hear people saying today, sorry for your luck. You should have been on the inside when the door was shut. We have to serve God faithfully. One day the door of the kingdom is going to be shut. And that's going to be at the second coming of Christ. It's not going to be people then saying, Oh, I want in. I changed my mind. I'll, I'll do what you want, Lord. Too late. You're on the outside. Only those on the inside will be those saved. His message particularly is to these Jewish leaders of his day that you think you're doing what God wants you to do. And you think you're going to be in that kingdom, but you're on the outside looking in and he's going to shut the door on you. And these Gentiles coming from the east and from the west, they're going to sit down in the kingdom. They're going to enjoy it and they're going to worship and they're going to be the friend of God rather than you because you went on the outside. What does that say about many today? They're going on the outside rather than doing what they should be doing. Well, let's go further. I don't have a lot of time left. I want to get into some modern errors that we see concerning the kingdom. I don't know how many of you receive the... Christian Chronicle. A lot of us call it the Unchristian Chronicle. I received mine in the mail about a week or two ago and I read an article. Then I don't know what I did with it. Probably trashed it. So I had to get on the website and I pulled the article off. thought this would be a, something good that help us understand how some people view the kingdom today. They had a lead article in this particular issue. It was entitled A National Survey Report. Teens envision a church more pleasing to God. Oh, you mean the teens are just now letting us know that we can have a church that's pleasing to God? Where have we been all of our lives? It's taken 13 to 14 to 15 year old kids now to tell us about the great church because we don't apparently know. Now, I remember when I was in the age just looking at, at people my age thinking these old fogies, they, yeah, they think they know everything. And now I'm to my age and I'm looking at these young ones. I'm saying, you little young whippersnappers, you don't know anything. That's not to say that young people don't have good ideas. I'm not saying that. They get into that in this article. I want to go through this article and show you how the kingdom or the church is viewed today. And to show you the mess we're in today and the problems that we're going to be facing more and more and our young people are going to be facing. It says, Teen Study. Young Christians wor worship at Winterfest in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. We can stop there and you already know where we're going. One of the three venues where researchers surveyed teens about Churches of Christ. Young Christians tout meteor Bible study. Not meteors from heaven, but having more meat in the Bible study. 
deeper relationships, and less judgmentalism. Okay, let's go to the first one, Meteor Bible Study. Well, what I would say if I could talk to Bob Ross Jr., Bobby Ross Jr., who wrote this article was, you should have had him over here this week. You'd get some meaty Bible studies. But, folks, that's not the kind of Bible studies they want. Well, they mean meteor Bible studies. They mean something that's going to make me feel so good about myself. I can hug and kiss everybody and pat you on the back, and it's just going to be so great. And it's so warm and fuzzy all over. That's the meteor Bible studies that most people are wanting now. Less judgmentalism. Who's being judgmental? <laughs> you read the article and you'll see who's being judgmental. It's like we've dealt with other things this week and we deal with them often. It's easy for people to sit and point fingers at us. You're judgmental. You're old mossbacks. You're old this. Blah, blah. And they're judging us for being judgmental. And, yeah, but they're not being judgmental. They've got a right to say it because we're a bunch of old troublemakers. What are they doing? They're causing trouble in the church. And they're causing the trouble in the church because they're not using the Word of God to stand behind what they're doing. We can back what we do with the Word of God. They can call us troublemakers all we want. But I'll stand with Jesus. He was considered a troublemaker of His day. And He answered them with Scripture. And we answer people with Scripture, and that's not enough. They don't like that. But let's go in this, this article. Researchers said, Students in this study speak of the church with great love, hope, insight, and wisdom. They suggest ways to cope with changing culture that respect the identity and mission of the church. I'd like to see some who would respect the identity of the church and the mission of the church. When you get through reading this article, you'll see they could care nothing about the identity nor the mission. Researchers surveyed 482 students among three national meetings, Winterfest in Texas and Tennessee, so there's two of them, and the Challenge Youth Conference in Tennessee. Many of you here may not know about that. I've got some material on that. I know a lot about it. We're going to talk about it as well if I have time. Among those findings, teens want more upbeat worship and meteor Bible study. What do you mean by upbeat? Let's define our terms. We pretty much know what they want by upbeat because one of them he says about the old stale worship these old gray-haired people have and we need to have it a little more lively. Lively. What do we want? Bands. Uh, we want people rolling down the aisles, flipping over the pews, uh, maybe a zip line from the loft down to here and swing down here. And Well, what do you want? Livelier worship. They need to define what they mean by livelier. I think we know based on evidence in the recent past, what is meant by livelier worship. Teens want deeper, more meaningful relationship with adult Christians. Okay, then act like you should as a Christian and seek encouragement and knowledge from the older Christians rather than trying to tell older Christians how dumb they are and they need to follow your ways. Teens seek uh, to go out and serve beyond church walls. Who ever said we want, don't want to serve beyond church walls? They need to come to spring. We door knock once a month here. Several other congregations do the same thing. Go beyond the church walls. That tells me they must not be doing much evangelism where they are. Why do it? They get the people to flock into them when they put all their innovations and their uh, good times, or as I heard one brother say, their nickels, numbers, and noise to keep all the things going. And teens perceive judgmental attitudes as hampering the spread of the gospel. What do you mean by judgmental attitudes? Telling people what the Bible say about the kingdom of God and they don't want to hear that? Okay, let's just don't do that anymore. That's basically what they're saying in here. The very first main point of this article is church people are too judgmental. Well, they actually say, have it as a question. Church people too judgmental? Well, that's what they find out. Jasmine Marie Smith, 16, a member of the Newman Church of Christ in Georgia, said her friends view the church people as judgmental and hypocritical. Brother Danny, you dealt with those hypocrites earlier, didn't you? Well, people need to quit being hypocritical. Judgmental? Because we teach what the Bible teaches? Mind you, you know this is coming from the Christian Chronicle, and you understand also the segment of folks you're talking to. Winterfest? I can't even remember how long it's been since Winterfest started, but 20 years probably. And when they started, they were off. They started with the most liberal of those in the church to have these groups of young people going for some big renewal weekend to make them all feel good. She also went on and said, they don't feel welcome when they walk through the door like they should. Well, what does she want the church to do about that? If they don't feel welcome, why don't you make them feel welcome? What is she doing to help her friends feel welcome? 
Now, I will say that I've visited some congregations in the past, and there was one I visited I don't know that I'd ever go back to again. Matter of fact, I know I wouldn't. They were the most unfriendly bunch of folks there ever was. I, I mean, being a preacher, I like to walk around and talk to people. I walk around, I shake and say, how you doing? They would look at me like, what are you, don't come speak to me. I mean, they would shake my hand, oh, how are you? And then turn and walk off, I'm almost in a run. <laughs> okay, I bathed this morning. Uh, Pope Sonia, what's wrong? Went to another person. They just, how are you doing? And he just walk off real fast. They wouldn't come speak to me, so I was going to speak to people. Preachers very nice, but overall the congregation, they weren't too friendly. So you might have that. That's a problem within the congregation that needs to be dealt with by the elders. Maybe the elders are not too friendly. That may be why the church is not. I don't know. But if that's the problem, they need to work on that within their congregation. Don't say the whole church is unfriendly and lump everybody together. She said, we're God's people. We should be opening our arms to His children that have gone astray. Amen. And we try to do that. But you can't drag them. Terry, I got some handcuffs. I brought some for you last year, but I had to go to work before you came, so I didn't get to use them on you. And I don't have them with me today, so can't use them on you now. But what do you want us to do? Go handcuff people and drag them to church? Throw them on the front pew and say, Repent, or we're going to beat you with a club. No, you don't do that. Sure, we want to go out and restore people. But they've got to want to be restored, folks. Another person, Alex Free, 17, member of the Caldwell Church of Christ in Idaho, said her agnostic and atheist friends feel uncomfortable with the judgments they feel surrounding the tenets I was raised with. They'll feel uncomfortable with any tenet that says anything about God. So what does that matter? You mention God, they're going to be uncomfortable no matter what you say you believe in. They don't want to hear it to begin with. Oh, but that's the reason the churches of Christ are bad now. We're, we're old mossbacks. We all not preach the Bible anymore. We shouldn't do anything anymore. Because we're making atheists feel bad. Well, I'm just so sorry. I know since I've been here, David and I have sent challenges out to several atheist organizations in this area, both in Montgomery County and Harris County, to the big atheist organizations, challenging them to debate. They won't even return our emails. They wouldn't return emails, so we sent one certified letter. They never even sent it back or sent anything in response. We'll challenge them to debate them on these issues. Not to hug and kiss them and say, it's okay, you don't believe in God, I believe in God, we're all going to be okay. God will take care of you anyway. No, it's not going to happen that way. There are some, one said, I thought the best way to share the love of Jesus was to love, not evangelize. Oh, and they're the ones who want us to listen to them. With this in mind, churches would, I believe, be better focused less on sin and more on God's love. Folks, how can you... Talk about God's love without talking about the sin that brought about God's love to us. Jesus, the very epitome of the love of God that came and died for us, He died because of sin. And you listen to these young folks that think we need to be listening to what they're saying? Well, to listen to their attitude, Jesus wasted His time coming. Forget about sin. Just say God loves you and it's all going to be okay. That's kind of things the church is having to deal with, folks. According to that person, Jesus should not have even come. But they would deny that if you went to them. Maybe that's just ignorance in youth. Another guy, uh, he actually stated something pretty good with the Piedmont congregation in Piedmont, Alabama. At one time was a faithful congregation. Uh, don't believe they are as much anymore. He said, advocates more focus on the Bible and less on personal opinions. That's good. I agree with that. He goes on to say, though, if adults will let the Bible speak for itself, then that would help the church out. Also, people within churches argue and debate each other. That only destroys the church, not benefits it. Now, if he's talking about arguing over personal matters or debate over personal matters because you just can't get along, he's exactly right. If he's talking about arguing over doctrine, then he's wrong. But it does go into that in this article. And, of course, the Christian Chronicle, even if he said about 15 or 20 minutes worth of stuff, they're only going to put what they want in here to make it look good for them. Well... You go on, and I only have about two minutes left. I don't have time to deal with a lot of these things. Uh, we've got one, Jessica Knapp, youth minister for the Mountain Avenue Church of Christ in Tucson, Arizona. That's all you need to know right there. She's a youth minister. Teens want to be inclusive of other people in viewpoints, she said. A student of mine is interested in being both Wiccan and Christian, not realizing there's a reason for mutual exclus uh, exclusively, uh, being exclusive. Wow, you know we say it, we're advocating letting some be Wiccans and Christians? 
Think about the foolishness, and this is supposed to be a youth ministry. Well, I don't have really any more time on that. Well, let me see one more. I've got to read this because this one girl said, In my youth group, people pour their hearts out in song, and you can feel the Holy Spirit moving in the room. There may be something moving in the room. maybe may be gas, but it sure is not the Holy Spirit like she thinks. I don't know what she's got moving in the room. She may have some problems, but uh, they feel the Spirit. Folks, this is ridiculous. By the way, that came from Winterfest. Two different ones, one in Texas, one in Tennessee, Gatlinburg. I read a little bit of the things about them. You don't have to read much about them. Jeff Walling just spoke on the one in Tennessee. That'll tell you enough. They had this uh, comedy skit. I think it was 321-something comedy skit. The one in Texas, there were complaints about it because uh, they were having skits in it, and apparently the article doesn't go into a lot of details. A pro inappropriate behavior going on. One of the youth ministers was in a skit with, I guess, one of the young ladies, I guess in his youth group, and there must have been some intimate moment in that skit that even shocked some of them at Winterfest. And they said they're going to bring a change, not let things like that happen. They're going to review the skits before they let them happen in the future. If they'd cut that out together and get back to the Word of God, you wouldn't have perverted youth ministers making moves on teenage girls. But that, again, folks, what you're dealing with. But let me deal with one thing, because I've got about 45 seconds, if my timer's right. <laughs> Challenge Youth Conference. This is the list of the speakers coming up, oh, actually, this weekend. It's going on right now, folks. you got Kyle Butt speaking and David Shannon speaking, Lonnie Jones speaking. Those three, okay, Kyle Butt and David Shannon have been on Polishing the Pulpit. That'll give you a little insight there. Webster's got a free pass, it seems like, and they're all embracing everything now. Lonnie Jones, I'm not going to call the brother's name, but there was a preacher well-known among the Memphis circles who told me personally when he lived in Alabama and preached in the congregation in an area where Lonnie Jones was, he said Lonnie Jones was one of the biggest liberals they had in their area. And now he's used on this, and all these, bunches, all these guys are fellowshipping Time to stop. Let me finish this. Fellowshipping all these other guys. Memphis has gotten in bed with all of them. And they think they know concerning the kingdom. More errors concerning the kingdom. Oh, and this one was on Jesus. Great sub subject. But what do you think these guys are going to preach about Jesus? Jesus the child, Jesus the man, Jesus the door, Jesus my Savior, and Jesus my friend. Those are the topics. And I imagine with some of these, at least... Kyle Butt, from what I know about him, will preach the truth on what he's doing. David Shannon preaches for the Mount Juliet, Tennessee church. I remember hearing several say, even those involved in Memphis, instructors, those in influential areas said that Mount Juliet was a liberal church. David Shannon was a liberal preacher, but over the last few years, because Webster's been using him, now he's all of a sudden sound, I guess. Oh, by the way, they had, uh, for entertainment... Ben and Travis, whoever they are, so a comedy thing. And the SWAT team. And Lynn, it's not the SWAT teams you and I would think about. It is uh, skits with the truth, I believe is what, is what it stands for. It's a skit group, a, con a skit troop that goes around from a congregation, and they perform skits in different places. Now, Challenge Youth Conference was supposed to be the sound alternative to Winterfest. When you look at the way they're outlined now, they're exactly the same. I got on the Challenge Youth Conference uh, Facebook page last night. They said, what can you do with 9,000 young people in one place? I also taught her, read about, oh, I'm out of tickets. I need a ticket to this session or that session. They have early and late sessions. They charge $25 a session, or $25 rather per individual to go for the weekend. You think, oh, that's not much. When we started charging to go teach people the gospel, they're doing that with polishing the pulpit now. Oh, it's grown too much. We can't handle it. We need other people uh, helping with this endeavor, so we're going to charge you to come. And they pout it as a lectureship. Unless something happens here and the elders go squirrely, you don't have to worry about having a charge to come and hear the gospel of Christ, folks. If Webster got too big for having that in, in a congregation, they had to go to a convention center and had to pay then figure out how you're going to get your money to pay. But you're charging people to come hear the gospel? Oh, they say it's a great price and you get great material. That's well and good. I remember years ago in Memphis when they uh, talked down to the people. 
that charge to go to lecture shifts. Now they're doing it themselves. I'm sorry, buddy. I'll quit now. <laughs> Don't want to get accused of going squirrely on us here. <laughs> uh, I couldn't help think, John, uh, you went into that congregation where they were pretty unfriendly. Uh, the uh, the handcuffs and the Glock on your belt might have given you a clue. <laughs> I didn't have that. Oh, you didn't have that. Okay. As you can tell, we appreciate John very much. and. Uh, the work that he does and uh, I know John you've, you've said it on a number of occasions uh, the people that you have to work with in the in the secular world but uh, it, it occurs to me it's uh, people like you and Lynn Parker and and well technically Ed Rutland is not law enforcement anymore but we uh, we need people like you out there to be the good influence so thank you John We'll stand adjourned for about five minutes.